welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Brew, and today we're talking about myth-making. How many myths are there in the world? I've, I've seen a book, haven't read it, but I've seen the book that says the seven plots, and like all of the books are supposed to have these seven plots. That's the only kinds of stories there are. I'm very interested to read that book one day when I get around to it. But it sounds Who like there's is something. the writer? The Seven Basic Plots. Christopher Booker. Hmm. Yeah. Who was it? So there it was looks a, kind um, of young Ian, apparently. There was a writer who talked about the basic plots and, you know, he he did the, the lines, rising tension, falling tension and all that. And I, I remember seeing some of those in your class, Greg, as well. But... There was That's a, just basic literary theory. <laughs> exactly. I but there was, a, them. <laughs> there was a specific 20th Joseph century Campbell? author. No, it wasn't Joseph Campbell. It was, cool. it was slightly more well known than that. I almost want to say it was Oscar Wilde who talked about four or five of these types of stories. And one of them he said was the Beauty and the Beast one. And basically, he said, this is the most beautiful story arc of all of them. And mm. I wish I could remember the actual reference now, because it just came to mind. <sighs> but we all know that's true, because The Beauty and the Beast is the best Disney movie ever made, for sure. Like, that's for correct. certain. Yeah. Okay, so, so there's no doubt about that. Uh, our good friend David <laughs> Farshman and I were once making a list of all the possible plots we could use in some novel someday. And once we had this list of about 20, 25 things, we started saying, oh, but wait, that one's just Jesus, and that one's Jesus, and that's Jesus, and wait, oh, this, a slave who uh, rises to be a free man and re no, it's Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> um, I once wrote an article uh, for Chalcedon, I think, ab about the origin of of myth. Lewis, of course, has a lot to say about it, so does Tolkien. But but Lewis is, wasn't really willing to suggest where myths came from, just that they had this great power to move us. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Jung and Freud, they have their ideas. Well, my suggestion is that what moves us is God's truth, either reflected, refracted through the crystal of imagination, or perverted through our dark minds that we can look at just about any kind of myth and find in it either a, a more or less true echo of the gospel or a very solid perversion of the gospel. Because man's mind is hardly original. We think our creator's thoughts after us. We don't make up anything on our own. And when we think we do, yeah, the, okay, five basic, seven basic, 12 basic, whatever, <laughs> there are only so many possibilities uh, and you can you can draw these out, one, by looking at scripture, two, by just thinking, we've got a problem here. What can we do? Well, we can succumb to it. We can go around. Okay, now we're doing basic psychological theory. Uh, we can overcome it. We can transform it. Uh, again, we, we're limited. But we're, what we're talking about here tonight is a little bit of potential history. Uh, where did some of these most ancient myths Egyptian mythology, Sumerian theology, Greek mythology, where where did it come from? And in the long run, the answer is, oh, I don't know. Because you know the wonderful thing about people making myths and trying to spawn them off as real? What is it, Greg? They don't tell us oh. that they just made up something. Uh, there's there's oh. no one who comes who writes down and says, let me tell you how we conned an entire age a hundred years ago and now that i'm safely dead you can publish my memoirs and and the truth will be out no, no one ever does that and so we're left always guessing even today with uh, mormonism there are lots of books that try to figure out where joseph smith got his ideas and they bring up uh freemasonry and all kinds of things islam <laughs> yeah, Islam. Uh, but again is that simply because man is unoriginal and there's not much you can do with with creating a new religion, you want to, especially if you want to sell it in the twentieth, well, nineteenth century, or are, are are they copycatting? And you know what, Joseph Smith didn't leave us a record to say, "Here's how I came up with it all and deceived thousands and thousands of people." So anything we talk about tonight is going to be largely speculation, possibilities, what ifs, 
But one thing right at the beginning, is it odd that man should come up with the idea that some man or other, say, oneself, could become God? And we look back at Genesis 3 and say, no, that's pretty standard. You shall be as gods knowing good and evil. <laughs> Do you think we gave that up after the fall that somehow we thought, well, that was a really dumb idea. Let's come up with something less dramatic and, and um, awesome. No, we, we, we keep going on. And we history's full of would-be god kings from the pharaohs, sons of the divine son, to the Caesars, to our Loki. own age. Loki. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Why is Loki so popular? But that's that maybe that's just the, the actor. <laughs> the Bible describes for us in Genesis uh, 11, the Tower of Babel, and speaks of this tower whose top was unto heaven, a uh, man's attempt by magic to reach deity, divinity, the heavens, to, to scale heaven and make it his own. We're not told a lot there. Uh, and, and as curious humans, we want to know all about that. What exactly was their creed, their philosophy, the mythology they propounded? Who was the ringleader? Who did this? Who did that? You know what? The Bible doesn't tell us. Probably, one, because it doesn't matter. And <laughs> two, because, well, it's again, it doesn't matter. Because the systems, the details of false religions don't matter. The Bible spends a lot of time ridiculing the gods of the ancient world, but at no point does it go into uh, a study of comparative religion to show us how Baal differed from Ra, how Dagon differed from Ashtaroth or whatever. It just lumps them all together as stone and wood. And it wasn't <laughs> because the, the biblical writers were ignorant of the mythologies. Daniel endured an education in Babylon U, probably got A's or whatever their equivalent was. And yet when it comes down to standing before Belshazzar and explaining the handwriting on the wall, he doesn't describe the Babylonian gods by names, although he certainly knew them. He just goes back to the Psalms and describes them as gods of wood and stone and gold and silver that never, neither speak nor move nor breathe. That's the Bible's attitude toward this. Yes, there's this philosophy that Man can be God and things can be God and things can be divine, but it the Bible just lumps it all together as nonsense, as lies, as Satan worship, as the work although of he, demons. Although God does call out the Egyptian gods, not by name, but in individual smackdowns with the 10 plagues. <laughs> this is true. I was just working through that um, for another article. And it's interesting to see who thinks what God was meant by what plague. And some of them are kind of easy. Sun going dark's pretty easy. <laughs> um, but I, I was surprised at how many variations I saw for the Nile turning to blood. For, to me, the mm -hmm. obvious thing is Osiris, but apparently there are other Nile gods. Because, because again, th there were gods for everything. It's not just that there was a god for everything. There were gods for everything. <laughs> every, yeah. every physical force phenomena process had multiple attendant deities because they're, they're worshiping the forces of nature. Yeah. And you can you can talk about the plagues and eventually we're going to have a discussion of those before too long. But God again does not name specifically. He just covers all kinds of stuff. He's smacking down left and right. And we can sit back and try to figure out who if anyone in particular he was aiming at, but I suspect he was dealing with a pretty broad hand. If they worshiped it, he hit it someplace. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some maybe a little more clearly than others. It's also where I always remember there's this one thing, it was attached to an anecdotal story, which I will not relate for sake of time, but essentially the end statement that stuck with me over the years was never do something for one reason when you can do it for three, followed by <laughs> the observation, God does things for infinite reasons. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, he, he struck the Nile and turned it to blood through the, the intermediary action of Moses. But it doesn't have to be just one god that he's attacking exactly. in that action. Exactly. So as as we're we're talking through this, we, we don't want to hang all of our philosophy of the ancient world on this one peg. It's just we're 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 driving along and glancing out the window and seeing that in the past some people have done that. I would Draw your attention to two books, not recommending either of them per se. Uh, Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons, and I believe the subtitle is something like 
papal worship proved to be the revived Babylonian religion or something like that. And um, I think a derivative work by a Colonel James Garnier is called The Worship of the Dead. And again, a subtitle that connects uh, papal worship to the worship of the dead, the, the pagan. Well, the books are very similar. Both trace the ancient myths back to Nimrod. And the Bible tells us that Nimrod, who just appears in the text, Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, the son of Cush, who was the son of Am, he was important. And he established a kingdom. It began at Babel and moved on to Nineveh and to other cities. And it just drops it, probably because everybody in the ancient world knew exactly who Nimrod was, whether that was his original name or a title, uh, and knew that there had been a great conqueror who, after the flood and either beginning at Babel or after the, the whole fiasco with the tower, uh, asserted himself and and became the first world tyrant in the, in the, in the post-flood world. So he's there and he was important or the Bible wouldn't mention him. Uh, we know that before too long, and, and we can trace this through secular writers, but we have to be very careful. We know that before too long, kings did start deifying themselves, or at least they were deified upon their deaths. And these these two books, uh, both from the Victor late Victorian era, try to argue that uh, Nimrod had a wife named Semiramis, and that upon his death, she in order to secure her authority within the, his kingdom, passed herself off as the virgin mother of God. Uh, that her she had a child, which given her character would not have been difficult, a uh, child out of wedlock, and claimed that it was, this child was the promised seed, the divine son of God, and she as the mother of this child should be respected, yada, yada, yada. Is there any truth in this? I don't know, for the same reason that I... Was trying to get at earlier, the priests, <laughs> Samaramis, Nimrod, the child when he grew up, didn't leave us any records where they said, you want to hear about this great con we pulled on the entire ancient world? They didn't tell us. And neither did those who followed them. But we do notice that throughout the ancient world, there is one, a lot of similarity between certain deities and, and gods and goddesses. And in some of the ancient historians, there is an acknowledgement that this that there's borrowing going on. The Greeks particularly borrowed from the Egyptians and the Phoenicians. And depending on who you read, you can try to trace who did what to whom when, and what names went where, and what names are originally Phoenician or Egyptian or Sumerian, and which are uh, are they muddled up into Greek, or do the Greeks just give them new names? We may never know the answer to all that. But it it does even ancient historians. Before Cicero mentions this, but before him, others, there was a man named um, Euhemerus. Euhemerus? Humorous? Anyway, his school of thought is you. I'm going to see if I can try if I can see if I can pronounce this. Euhemerism. I think that's right. Basically, argued that all the gods were men who were deified. Well, we know that the pharaohs were deified. Uh, we know that Alexander and Caesar claim to be sons of God. There's nothing unlikely in any of this. The only question is, or the questions are, I suppose, was there an original, an historical original, uh, Nimrod, Samarimus, or someone or something else? Or do we just all think alike and end up coming up with the same basic themes? Uh, is fertility worship because, was it originally a royal ploy to maintain, maintain power for a particular woman? Or do men just like to worship sex and visit temple prostitutes because they're fallen and rotten sinners? And we may never know all of the answers. But now would be a good time, I think, just in general to talk about this temptation to worship rulers, to worship personalities, mm -hmm. political personalities, celebrities, people with a certain aura uh, that just draws us after them. And we, we bow to them as those who walk on water. Did I ring any bells or do any historical figures in the last couple hundred years come to mind in all of this? You laughed. You get to go first. Oh, <laughs> Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going for, for starters. Go Has it been Why? sensitive to point out he technically would have wheeled across water? <laughs> oh. Except he wouldn't have let people know that in his campaigns. He went to That's great true. lengths to conceal his disability. Um. 
I just, you can do it. Um, <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> uh, no, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, go ahead. Roosevelt is very frustrating to me personally because when you read through American history, you start, well, ideally you start before the Constitution and before the Declaration of Independence, mm. so you get some idea where those things came from. But you get there and you read about these great ideas of human rights and you know, where all those ideas came from and you keep going and you keep going and you get to Roosevelt and he's like, rights, those seem like a great idea. I think I'll add a few. And he just like <laughs> invents these human rights out of nowhere, citing no sources. He's like, housing is a human right. Medicine is a human right. And it's like, yes, I want everybody to have housing and medicine, but that's not a right in the same way that like the right to assemble and go to church is a right. Positive and negative rights are... Yeah, well, there's a good two different point. things. Yeah, the the rights were that amount to civil government. Leave this alone. You have no mm -hmm. authority. As opposed to those of, oh, this isn't happening. Civil government, fix it, make <laughs> <Right>. it so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the the divine Messiah who saved us. Now, I I'm older than you, and my parents both went through the depression, and um, they were they were fairly young. My grandparents, and I knew my grandma on both sides, very much were, were young adults during the Depression. And they remember, all of them remember Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, and my dad became a staunch conservative in his adult years. And he looked at, at Roosevelt with such disdain because everyone in that era basically believed he could walk on water. He saved us. We were in this horrible depression and he saved us and he led us through this war to victory and we could not have done it without him. Don't you dare say a bad word about him. And you really couldn't. Uh, if you said anything nasty about FDR, you'd get yelled at. You'd get in a lot of trouble with a lot of people. Uh, did, did they think he was God? Well, probably not. But did they assign him powers and abilities or, or maybe simply were they okay with things he did mm. that they shouldn't have been okay with? Mm -hmm. Did they look to him and the, the governmental philosophy and force that he represented as their savior? Uh, were they willing to, to give up freedoms, liberties, rights in order to let him be their savior so that they could feel okay about the world? It's an ongoing temptation, and that generation is not alone in facing it, nor was the United States alone in facing it about that time. Mm -hmm. So do other names come to mm -hmm. mind since we're in the 40s well, right now? Yeah, there's Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini. Yeah, well, uh, I could even add uh, a certain 16th president to the list. <laughs> Ooh. I don't know my presidents anyway, that well. I'm a bad American be, history major. That would be Lincoln, dear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Habeas corpus? Oh. Maybe a Habeas corpus. Oh. <laughs> oh. I am, I'm, for, for our audience out there, I actually am more of a fan of Lincoln than my friends here, but that's for a, a, It's just another, this one thing time. where he suspended habeas corpus, which is like one of those rights that we talked about. <laughs> yeah. Which can be suspended during wartime, but that's, you know, whether or not it was a wise or even lawful thing is another discussion. Or whether he was admitting there was a war. I thought it was just a rebellion. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm, yeah, about that. And then, well, anyway. and then the whole the whole Republican Party afterwards. If was it a war or rebellion? Because if they never left, then how can we put restraints on them coming back? And yeah, you're right. Let's yeah. not go there. <laughs> um, but let's go. Let's go back to our friend Adolf Hitler. You know, there is an entire generation who does not know who he was. Yes. When I was growing up, if you wanted to defeat the basic relativism argument of there are no morals. There are no apps. All you had to do is say, how about the six million? And everybody, uh, well, well uh, that's, um, yeah, that was bad. Um, 30 years later, well, given their culture and time, the people thought it was something they needed to do. So I guess for them, it was all right. Mm. But yeah, there was uh, this new generation, uh, younger than you even, they really don't know exactly who Adolf Hitler was anymore uh, for the sake of anybody out there who's, you know, younger than 20 and may not know. He was a dictator who pulled Nazi Germany together 
got the economy up and running through socialist, fascist means. But he was able to do it because of what amounted to a cult of personality. The Germany was down and out. They'd been beaten up and stomped upon and had nothing left to lose. And he came along and uh, arranged some nice scapegoats in the form of the Allies and the world bankers and, of course, the Jews, and said, you were betrayed, but follow me and I can give you back everything you have and more because you are the hope of the world. The Aryan race is tomorrow's future. He was not necessarily a follower of Nietzsche, but he took some Nietzsche-esque ideas and, and, and carried them over into uh, a mystical level. Uh, there was a great deal of, of mysticism behind the scenes in, in Germany in those days. Mm. Uh, one author wrote, the, 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 who is it? The Aryan has one foot in Atlantis. There was a belief that mankind had evolved in Atlantis or Ultima Thule, some some fallen continent where man had nearly achieved divinity, but then along came this Mongol race, read Jews, blacks, so on, and had uh, distorted, degraded uh, the biological, evolutionary, spiritual process, and brought an end to all of that. And then this race fled. And thus today, the modern Aryans, the, the one step that was just ready to make the transition to divinity, the next step in human evolution, spiritual step. Mm -hmm. uh, and Hitler convinced the German people that you're, you're these people, you are the hope of the world. Follow me and I will secure your future. And when you've got nothing else to live for, you, you're open to all kinds of nonsense. So uh, Hitler began a campaign of reunifying Germany and the Allies for various reasons, which are beyond our scope here, led him uh, step by bloody step until things got out of control and we had a world war in our hands. And yet he still, against the whole force of the Allied world, almost won because of his daring as audacity and this formidable personality that's what amounted to a religious cult that placed him at the center. If they did not call him God, that's, it wasn't far from that. And of course, everybody who remembers Nazism remembers that Nazis are bad people. <laughs> I, I, side note, I was interested in um, the first Captain America film, mm -hmm. that Nazis were dropped and Hydra was put in its place. Mm. Uh, you look on the map and they're Hydra forces, not Nazi forces, not German forces. I'm not sure what that was all about, unless it's possible that the creators didn't think Nazi carried enough tang anymore. Mm. Um, it does anyway. get thrown around a lot. Uh, I mean, the Nazis... started to lose its meaning. Yeah, that's true. The Nazis like show up for five minutes in the first movie. And I think from then on the point... I'm getting into a screenwriting discussion. Let's... <laughs> 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 Well, since you're not going into the screenwriting, I'm going to go into the history and just clarify. Um, you paired the words socialist and fascist, which is yeah. something you don't often hear oh, yeah. these days. People think socialist is a little bit center little left, left and yeah. fascist is way far Extreme right. Right. Yeah. right. Well, fascist is actually technically, historically, it's an Italian nationalism, but this idea of nationalism, this strong charismatic leader, these certain um, aspects of it were very much mirrored in Nazi Germany with Hitler. There's a great, well, it's not great. It's great from a historical perspective that this thing exists and we can read it. But uh, Mussolini wrote an encyclopedia entry defining fascism because he was oh, really? the head of the fascist party. Yeah, it's sure. really interesting to read. Um, not endorsing fascism, but Great that that article exists for us to read for research <laughs> yes, good purposes. Good clarification there. Yeah, sure. Uh, of course, yeah. uh, Nazism is simply shorthand for national socialism. Right. And yeah. <laughs> Hitler and Mussolini were best buds for a while. And Mussolini <laughs> while. was Hitler's idol until he proved incompetent. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, this tendency to, to make fascist uh, Nazis, whatever, some kind of extreme right-wing phenomena and socialism, some kind of mild left-wing phenomena, is a complete distortion of political reality and of history. Mm -hmm. I, I had, in, when I was in high school, I had a secular textbook that was actually pretty good. It tried to be fair to everybody. It failed, of course, but it, 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 they weren't vicious or mean. And there was this little table where, where they compared fascism and socialism. 
And then they had a number of points of contrast, which amounted to when you when you boiled it all down, um, let's see, the the fascist emphasized uh, nationalism and the socialist internet, the communist inter, international socialism. <laughs> and um, the fascists hated the, the communists, the communists hated the fascists. Yeah, that was about <laughs> it. I, I was amazed at how actually rem accurate it was with, but not self-consciously. It's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like they thought they had just pared these down to so many points of contrast when they really, okay. So in other words, if, if, if Hitler and Mussolini thought about taking over the world, it was by accident. Whereas <laughs> communism always planned out from the beginning. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> so who's the real mm, threat here? Uh, anyway, but you're right. That was a side issue, but it's not because we're talking about man wanting to be God. And there's two ways you can go about that in the long run. You can adopt some kind of mystical theology that says, I within myself will find the sparks of deity. I will turn within myself or reach out beyond myself and lay hold on some ultimate reality and thus become God. Or in a far more practical sense, I will seize all the power I can right here and lord it over everybody else. Or I see that someone else is doing it and I will help them, hoping that I will at least be a, uh, a priest or prophet to this up and coming God. Uh, we want somebody who can fix the world for us, give us all that we want. And whether it be by some kind of mystical, magical means, or whether it be by sheer political, military, economic power, in the long run, matters, I suppose, only in this, unless you merge them, that the, the guy who's sitting on a pillar, meditating on his navel, trying to be God, is probably less of a threat to us <laughs> than the civil ruler who... Uh, is busy abolishing all of our rights because he loves us so much. <laughs> Put the two together and you get really dangerous, especially when everybody believes the religious myth that this man's God. Mm -hmm. And you have not simply the political side of it where he's acting like a God, you have with it the mystical dimension of, oh, by the way, did we mention, he really is. And uh, when you turn to the book of Revelation, however you want to interpret the details, you look at chapter 13, here's this beast and everybody says, who's like him? Who can make war with him? Uh, the whole world, the whole land worships him. And he ends up imposing his will upon everybody and begins persecuting God's people, obviously, because who's the one group that's going to stand up and say, you are not. <laughs> <laughs> that would be us. That would be Christians. So when we, we start talking about the gospel, about the true son of God coming into our history, true God, true man, the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We're, yes, we are most certainly talking religion. We are talking about our direct relationship with the God who made the world. But the political implications are inescapable. And Rome discovered this one real fast, as did the church. Rome would have been very happy to let Christians have their religion, practice it any way they wanted to, build churches, hospitals, schools, what publishing houses, theaters, you know, whatever. They just had to do one little thing. They had to take some incense from the altar and uh, light it up to uh, an image of Caesar and sacrifice to the genius of the emperor, the city, the fortune of the city of Rome, and say, Caesar is Lord, Caesar est dominus. And Christians mm. absolutely refused because the first creed of the ancient church was Jesus is Lord. And with that, the persecutions began. And we're, it's easy to wonder, would we have the faith and the clarity of vision today to make that stance, to say, mm. we give up all of the, the benefits of modern society, of technology, of public assembly, of everything, in order to insist that Jesus is our Lord, and you don't get to tell us whether or not we can worship him. He trumps you on that, and we will follow him to our deaths. Before this whole coronavirus thing is over, it's just possible that may become an issue some places. <laughs> Time will tell. <laughs> and it's worth mentioning the, the temptation to the ancient church in Rome was functionally no different than Satan's final temptation to Christ. Where mm. 
you know, I'm gonna, I won't even fight you anymore. All you have to do is one little thing. <laughs> it's a catch twenty two. Yeah. Before we shift to recommendations, probably we should say a word about the dying god myth. James Fraser in the Victorian era went around collecting all the myths he could that seemed to fold together along a common theme. The the king slash god slash divine lover slash virgin born child who comes miraculously into the world, possibly through a virgin goddess, and then dies in some horrible fashion, maybe uh, skewed by a boar, maybe hung on a tree. And, and then after a, a time of weeping and mourning, rises again into deity. And it, it is true that as far as we can see, there are some myths like that. It's hardly surprising. I mean, we're back to, there are only so many stories in the world. <laughs> and the original Pro Evangelium, uh, Genesis 3.15, seed of the woman, seed of the serpent, bruised heel, crushed head, along with God's ongoing promise of resurrection, which resonates throughout the Old Testament. It would not be terribly difficult for someone to come up with the idea that there will be a great hero who will die and rise again. How many times this actually happened is open to debate because sometimes it's unclear whether some of these myths preceded Christianity or followed it. <laughs> Certainly, uh, we have the Osiris myth that, that has a long history. Uh, Osiris is killed by his brother, cut in pieces, and Isis, uh, fluttering as a dove over the body, conceives the hero god Horus, who comes back and destroys the evil brother Set and reigns as the new sun god. Does that kind of sound like a uh, dying rising god? Not exactly, although Osiris gets better, all bandaged <laughs> and such. But his resurrection is simply an endurance into the next world where he reigns as lord of the dead. It's it, it, and this, this is a thought about resurrection. Uh, the ancient world had no thought of resurrection because resurrection means that man is forever a creature. Mm -hmm. And that's the very thing that paganism despises. We don't want to be creatures. We want to be gods. Mm. And so Osiris in rising, in being resurrected, does not return in the flesh. He passes on to the spirit realm, his spirit intact and divine. Mm -hmm. That was their idea of resurrection. And that set the pattern for Egyptian religion and Egyptian funerary rites. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's there's no idea these people are going to come back in their physical bodies, but as long as their physical bodies were preserved, their spirits would survive on the other side through magic, stand before Osiris, and if judged true true and faithful, lighter than the feather of truth, they would pass on to the, the heavenly fields and themselves become little Osiris' gods reigning forever and ever, whatever. It's not... There's no resemblance here between the Christian idea of the death and resurrection uh, of our Savior as a penal substitute, his physical victory over death so that he came back in a real body as a real living human being uh, and sent into that body to reign over the universe. Mm. The, the, primary, and, and the primary issue here, uh, however you track the pagan myths, is that most that they can give us is that man is beset by the chaos of the universe. In other words, the world's out to get you. But follow this, this charismatic, godlike figure who went all the way to death and came back and beat the universe and ascended into deity. Follow him using some kind of esoteric knowledge, some kind of drug-induced trance, some kind of magic spell, some kind of esoteric philosophy. And you too can overcome all of your problems hello, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and <laughs> reign as a deity. Well, there's absolutely no similarity between that and Christianity. Christianity says mm -hmm. you're a creature. You've, you've ethically rebelled against a holy God. You deserve to go to hell. God himself and the person of his son became a penal substitute. So that if you place your faith in him, you will be atoned for, justified, uh, declared legally righteous before God so that you can become a creaturely son, adopted son of God, and live with God in fellowship forever. You don't mm. get to be a God. So whatever similarities may or may not exist between some of these pagan myths and the Christian gospel, 
at the most fundamental level, they're completely antithetical. They're not the same story. They're not the same myth at all. And Emily, you were going to share with us a, um, a comment on Horus. Uh, yeah, I wanted to bring up this great little satire video from Lutheran satire who did the St. Patrick's bad analogies that we've referenced before. Uh, it's called Horus Ruins Christmas. And you have a Lutheran pastor finishing up his Christmas service. And he's just saying, thanks for everybody for coming. And he hears a voice and it comes and it's Mithros. And he's claiming, you know, before there were legends of your Jesus, there were legends of me. And he claims, you know, I was born of a virgin. I suffered, I died and rose again. And it's, it's very funny, but also very informative. Uh, the different uh, mythologies that, uh, the creator of this satirical video looped in. He brings up Mithras, brings up Baldrick, which is really interesting because nowadays in uh, Nordic mythology circles, they've realized that, you know, a lot of Norse mythology was influenced by Christianity. And so they've realized that this sort of, oh, Baldrick the Beautiful, he's dead and he has to rise and there's going to be some sort of reckoning at the end of time. People have realized that's kind of an influence that's Christianity kind of being cool. And the Norse mythology <laughs> sort of imitates the cool Christian uh, story. No one could imagine that the day that Christianity is so cool, you actually want to imitate it. <laughs> mm. right. Of course, in the, in the 1800s, quite a few people thought it was cool enough to imitate, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'll put that uh, link to the... A Lutheran satire video in the show notes. It's called Horace Rosen's Christmas. I wanted to go back to what you were talking about before, Greg, about specifically the the supposed connection between Christ and the Egyptian mythology. It's like, one, wow, that's weird. Gnosticism keeps showing up. <laughs> and second, they try to use this vague sort of similarity of of death being overcome in some manner to claim that Christianity has stolen this idea or repurposed it <laughs> right. from a, from the previous uh, belief, the previous mythology. But you're, you're right in saying these are antithetical in their worldview. It, it's, it'd be similar to saying, well, the Egyptian myth had this godlike figure and Christianity has a godlike figure. Hmm, looks like Christianity stole an idea. <laughs> That's like the extent. It's 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 a yeah. category. The, yeah, stole, there's like a public stolen, domain if you want to even of make that things. Way. <laughs> there's yeah, a public a, domain of things that everybody draws from. No. A public domain anyway. of things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Public domain. Yeah. Which are all derivative from the gospel. Right. Mm -hmm. Because back to where we started. We are not original thinkers. We think our creator's thoughts after him, either mm -hmm. to adorn them more often to degrade them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's With a sad note to thought. end on. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's switch to recommendations. Uh, I'm going to recommend something that is a meditation on thinking God's thoughts after him to adorn them, as you said. Uh, it's a poem by J.R.R. Tolkien of Lord of the Rings fame. Uh, it's a poem that he wrote when he was pretty young. He was at Oxford. Oh, that Tolkien. It's Maudlin College at Oxford or Cambridge. I'm blanking. It's Oxford, right? There is a Maudlin College at Oxford. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so he was chilling with his buddy C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis wasn't a Christian yet. And they were talking about myths and C.S. Lewis at that point was like, they're all just lies, lies, lies breathed through silver, I think was his phrase. And Tolkien, after talking with him at length, wrote this poem called Mythopoeia mm. about how myths are important from a Christian perspective. They're important to the fabric of the universe. Um, so I am going to recommend that. I'm not going to read it all because it is slightly lengthy, not like oh, not like epic poem lengthy, but too long to read on the air. Um, but I'll link it in the show notes. Mythopoeia by J.R.R. Tolkien. Greg, do you well, have a recommendation? Yes, I actually have one, thanks to you. Yay. <laughs> I believe the author's name is Richard Pertrill, and you can 
check it out for me, make sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. I don't have it in front of me. It's called Lord of the Elves and Eldils. Mm. It's gone through a couple uh, editions. And what the author does is to look at the writings of Lewis and Tolkien and kind of set them side by side in categories of how do they deal with religion as Christians? How do they deal with language? How do they deal with concepts of good and evil? And the author was very, very familiar with everything they had written that had been published to that point. Unfortunately, he wrote before the Silmarillion saw the mm -hmm. light of day. I think in the later version he does, he doesn't change the original text, but I think he does add a chapter or two to, to account for the new information we have. It's very well written, very enjoyable. The author's a Christian and he's he draws out things about the way they wrote and the way they think and how they were in some ways very similar and how in some ways approached these ideas uh, very differently, putting their personalities, the gifts and their own education. If you like Tolkien and you like Lewis, it's it's a fun read and you will learn things. Cool. Brian. Yes. Um, well, I'm having trouble deciding between two things, so I'm just going to recommend both of them. There you uh, go. Oh, a cheater. I am a, very much a cheater. Thank you. <laughs> like I've never done that before. <laughs> no, you've never ever cheated. Um, so the first thing is a practical, tactile, tactile object. If you like writing utensils, we were just talking, I just mentioned this uh, before we actually started recording this episode. Fountain pens. Ah. Yay. They are fun. They are. I love them. They're really just the smoothest writing instrument I've ever dealt with. I've tried gel pens and ink. Bix are just awful anyway. But um, <laughs> every every other kind I've tried, there's always been some kind of catch on the paper or something, and these just they flow so smoothly. I just I've never experienced anything like them, and uh, that's my nerding out about well, what, that. What manufacturer? Because I grew up using fountain pens at school. I did not have your experience. So is it a particular <laughs> brand, a particular higher quality? Uh, I believe so, probably. Uh, my current everyday carry is a Lamy Safari. Uh, nice. They are okay. German. That's, that's made. beyond me. Yeah. <laughs> They're a German made pen. So the German precision is uh, yes. yeah. evident. I also have a few others that I, I haven't used in a while. Uh, there's a Conklin Duragraph, I think it is. Uh, that's, mm. that's more on the pricier side even than the like the Lamy probably ran me 20 bucks and you know the ink was another five i think and it's lasted i haven't even gotten through all the ink that i got for it anyway that's my first recommendation my second recommendation is more <laughs> personal and that is i recommend human interaction we're in the middle of this <laughs> shelter in Why place are you protocol. recommending the one thing i can't get brian <laughs> Well, Wait, you'll have to husband. listen. You'll have to listen to my uh, my caveats. We're in the oh, middle of okay. this shelter-in-place protocol, yeah. especially here in California and uh, multiple other states across the country, where we're all being told don't go outside unless it's for something absolutely essential, or going to the hospital, or getting food, or other things. Don't make physical contact with people outside of your household. Uh, yeah. Plague, lepers, everything. And what I've realized over the past few weeks of this is that I really like interacting with people in person. <laughs> uh, and while I'm not able to do this, there have been uh, many wonderful things that have helped bridge the gap. For one, spending time with my, my family, with whom I am quarantined, for lack of a better term. And, and also... Dog. And my dog. He's also quarantined. He's stuck with me. That's not human interaction, though. That's oh, canine that's interaction. Yes. But I, I also human, recommend canine humanity. interaction. Yeah, it's, it's human to interact with canines. There it yes. is. Um, yeah. But... There have been other things to help bridge the gaps. For instance, we're currently doing this recording and we're seeing each other's oh, faces. Oh, that's right. Sky. We're not breaking social distancing guidelines. That's we are right. 3,000 are... miles of social distance. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> or 20 in the case of Greg and me. Um, yeah. <laughs> but also, I've, been watch I've watched movies with friends across the country uh, through things like Zoom. We all hit play at the same time. Mm. And... Just talking to people over video chat and the, just these little tiny everyday things have helped sustain me personally through this extended time of isolation. <laughs> so I recommend interacting with people. You can use Zoom mm. or you know Facebook is pretty versatile. You can do text and video calls and all sorts of things through that if that's your only avenue of technology for this. Uh, otherwise, Zoom, Skype, Cast various other things. Discord. I recommend talking to people. <laughs> yeah. 
I was uh, <laughs> having to clear up some things about my um, family's insurance. And it's been difficult to get through because everybody's concerned about insurance in California right now. Oh, yeah. Finally, finally, finally got a hold of, uh, of a guy. And as he was doing the computer stuff for me, and it was taking a long time, he just kind of started, so, uh, you have family? Are you doing anything? <laughs> it, took me, it took me a minute to realize he's saying, yeah, usually I'm here with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people in a building, and right now I'm all home alone. Oh, oh no. this poor guy. <laughs> so I tried to, what can oh, you do? Yeah. I, I, yeah. You know, there's protocols and things. You can't really... Hey, here's my phone number. Um, but I tried at least to <laughs> cheer him up and describe our crazy family and our crazy cats and things. But <laughs> and I've been I've tried to be very careful. Anytime I see somebody who's and I had to go by the hospital, the pharmacy to pick up some medicine to try to encourage anybody who's putting themselves in the gap to mm -hmm. stop and say thank you, thank you for yeah. what you're yeah. doing. It's a pain, and you are taking a risk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so thank you. So something, something to do when, as you say, human contact. Some thank you, some, hey, how's your life going? Here, let me show you a picture of my girls. They're really cute. And my cats, they are too, but for different reasons. <laughs> you know, something to to restore a little humanity in the midst of all this. Mm -hmm. Good good suggestion, Brian. Yeah. And I'll also add to that, everyone knows at least someone who's in the medical field. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's kind of a ubiquitous profession. Oddly enough, health mm -hmm. Uh, services yeah. are ubiquitous. Um, <laughs> we all them, have help. Tell them thank you, oh, thank you and ask <laughs> if there's anything you can do to help them because they are stressed, very stressed at the moment. I know yeah. probably at least two dozen medical professionals through mm. the wider reformed internet, and all of them are very stressed and mm -hmm. over or overburdened with the current situation. Yeah. So yeah. anything you can do to support them or give them a helpful word or ask if you can make a meal for them even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. If I can hijack this to give a shout out to my dad, he is actually in New York right now. Um, oh. He's not a medical professional, but he's providing basically a listening ear to the health professionals who are encountering not only a lot of stress, but the trauma of seeing the suffering. Mm. Um, it's a lot for a person to go through. It's not natural to see people suffer, or rather it is natural because it's in nature, nature of the world, but it's not good for humans to watch other people suffer. It's yeah. very hard yeah. on you. Um, and so my dad is up there helping people through trauma. And so I'm really proud of him. So we can yeah. be praying for him, too. That's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Yes. All right. And that is all the time we have for tonight. Stay safe out there, everybody. You can email us. Tell us how you're doing. Tell us how you're surviving the quarantine. Our email address is... Give us some is, tips. Give us some tips. Yeah. I'm going a little bit cabin, cabin fever, cabin crazy. Just a little bit. But our email address is haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. Uh, you can like our page on Facebook. I'm kind of on Twitter, not super present, but you can follow me on Twitter if you want to. I am present on Goodreads, so follow me on Goodreads. <laughs> you can check out our show notes that'll have any links to things that we mentioned, um, transcripts if you'd rather read than listen or know someone who would rather read than listen. If you would like to support us financially, you can do that through our Anchor homepage, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or through PayPal, paypal.me slash halting towards Zion. And you can leave us a review on iTunes or Spotify. I don't know if Spotify does reviews, but uh, if you want to give us as many stars as you think we deserve, that would be much appreciated. That helps us get out into the world. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you've enjoyed this, learned something. We've had a lot of fun. So see you next week. Bye.